Good morning. Good morning. Welcome Good morning. to Cynthia. We're so glad that you're here. Familiar face joining us again uh, for the summer people. So glad to have her back. We had a lot of fun this morning, so we're going to enjoy this. If you are uh, ready to begin worship today, let's stand. Let's open our hearts, open our minds. Let's go closer this morning in a walk with Christ. Summer. Um, 
Let me caveat that by saying, if you haven't signed up and you're a part of the centenary family, we'll figure that out. Uh, but as far as um, as any other folks signed up, we, we hit capacity this year. We have not hit capacity for our VBS volunteers and helpers, and that's something we're looking for. So if you are interested, if you feel God tugging at your heart strings a little bit, reach out to Sarah Davis, and if you don't know Sarah Davis, just reach out to me. But uh, we are seeking volunteers. Um, now let's go to the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve. Uh, there is a men's uh, 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 pancake dinner just coming Friday night at what time? Five o'clock. Five o'clock. I have tickets for sale if anybody needs them. There's probably other people that do as well. Or you can buy them at the door. Or you can buy them at the door. Oh, my goodness. I know there's announcements everywhere today. All right. So the Children's Choir next uh, Saturday and Sunday will be performing their spring musical for the first time since 2019. The musical is called God's Not Dead. We will be performing it in the Fellowship Hall. So the 930 service next week, we will meet in the Fellowship Hall instead of in here. Okay, so they'll perform at 930, 11 on Sunday and 530 on Saturday night if you can't make either one of those. All right. Does anybody else have any more announcements? <laughs> All right, let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks that we are here this morning in your presence, and we feel the power of your spirit in us. Draw us ever closer to you during this hour of worship today. Strengthen our hearts, strengthen our minds, and, and sharpen our ears to hear your word. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's stand and continue this time of worship. Yeah. 
show this morning. This morning, I'd like to show you guys a simple exercise move, okay? You guys like doing some exercises? Yeah. Okay, so think about the exercise moves that you know, okay? And you think about what you think I'm gonna teach you, and now you try to teach what you think I'm gonna teach you to them, okay? I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to do it. How does that sound? Okay, so everybody face face the congregation. Everybody say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so you try to teach them the exercise move. I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to do it. Do your best exercise move. What do you think I'm gonna teach you? Show me. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Wow, good job, guys. You did a great job. Some of those moves I think were more fun than the one I was going to teach you. I was going to, I was going to teach you how to uh, how to jog in place. And basically, oh, oh, oh. can you help me show everybody how to do? Because what you do, you take one foot up real high, right? And as you're putting it down, you bring the other one, and you're moving your arms at the same time like this, right? Yeah. That's how we jog in place. Well, good job. High fives. Two of them. Woo! Can you guys show me how to jog in place? Good job. I won't ask you guys to show me how to jog. Thank you. You can run in place? Wow, that's very cool. Do you think had I gone first and taught all of you how to do that, that it would have been easier to teach them? Yeah, yeah that would have made it a lot easier, wouldn't it? In today's scripture story that we're going to share in just a moment, Jesus is teaching his disciples a new rule. To love others just like I have loved you. I can do this. That's awesome. <laughs> so here's some things about loving actions that Jesus does to his disciples. Y'all listen and repeat these, okay? He invited them to be students. He invited them to be students. Yep. He shared stories with them. And he showed them how to talk. He showed them how to talk. And listen with to God. So, and you know what? If we read these stories about Jesus, then we can also have these same actions that Jesus showed to his disciples. In this way, Jesus shows us how to be his students. And because we can see how Jesus showed his love towards his disciples, then we, we can see how we're to love one another just like Jesus loved them. And as Jesus' disciples, then because Jesus loved us first, we know how to love others like Jesus loved us. And that's our good news for today. All right, will you guys pray with me? Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who shows your love to his disciples, so that they and we can see how to share your love with others. Thank you and amen. All right, guys, you guys have a fun morning at Children's Church.
uh, from the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, then God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be God. Please be seated. <laughs> It's a great pleasure to welcome the Reverend Dr. Roger Elliott, who's on back among us. Uh, Roger Surrey is a pastor here at Centenary from 1983 to 1989. I told the folks at the uh, early service that when I came into the uh, came into the conference, uh, Roger was already at Edenton Street, the highest steeple in our conference, and I was quite impressed the first time he called me by name at annual conference. Uh, when I was at uh, campground with Roger Surf before coming here to Centenary, uh, I heard quite a bit about the, uh, about the departing gift that was purchased for him uh, so that he might enjoy his, his hobby of duck hunting. And uh, still haven't heard whether or not it worked and whether or not you got anything. So we welcome Roger to come and share with us. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you. Good to be back at Centenary. And just to follow that up, it was a very fine shotgun. I did hunt with it. And occasionally I would hit something. <laughs> but, but not too often. But it was a nice gift. There was a fellow there that had several ponds and, and did a lot of duck hunting. And that was my first experience with that. But, but they convinced me it was pretty good to do. And if you like duck, it's also a very good thing to do. But anyway, I'm glad to be here. I look out and see your faces, and I'm so glad to see you. I doubt any of you were around 33 years ago when I was here. Oh, thank you. Got one. All right. But I see a couple of others. So it's hard to believe 33 years has come and gone, but it certainly has. And, uh, uh, but my time here was a wonderful time, and my family and I have, have so many, many wonderful memories of I won't reminisce much here because there's so few of you who were here at the time, but, but I will tell you that uh, we got a wonderful welcome. There were a couple ladies in the church who were probably in their early 80s, but they loved to bake. And uh, they just showered us with all kinds of good stuff while we were here, and, and our children still remember it today. I, I remember that the first time we drove here, uh, things were a little different back then. You weren't supposed to go to the church you were appointed to until it was the day to go. Um, so when we drove up and saw this uh, church, my children said, Dad, this is a castle. This is not a church. <laughs> so, but I, they learned to, to love the castle, and uh, we, we all did. Uh, I, I want to read to you this morning, and I want to first of all thank Tom and the committee for inviting me to come back. It's, a, it's an honor to come and be a part of this 250-year celebration. But I want to read to you this morning from uh, 1 Samuel, the 7th chapter, and I just want to use... A few of the verses there, not as many as I've listed because we'll talk about those later. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty voice that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were routed before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mitzvah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as far as beyond Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mitzvah and Jehoshaphat and named it Ebenezer, for he said, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. The hand of the Lord was against the Philistines in the days of Samuel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your presence in our midst. Thank you for this great church, for its long, wonderful history. We ask you to continue to be with it in the days ahead. For Jesus, it is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
During this year, you are celebrating, as you know, the 250th anniversary of Centenary United Methodist Church. And uh, again, I'm honored to, to come and be a part of that. 250 years, it's amazing to think about that. Continuing existence, not just started somewhere and stopped and started, but continuing existence. Now, you probably know the history better than I do, and I just want to hit the high points. Um, in, on December the 24th, 1772, Joseph Pilmore came here, and on Christmas afternoon, which was the next day, he gathered with a group of people who were Methodist-minded, and that was the beginning of this group, this church. Um, it, it grew, uh, people came, I, I remember reading, I didn't go back and check it, but I think uh, one of the leaders suggested that they needed services more regularly than they were having them, and so they had to, to get the circuit riders to come more often to Newburgh. Francis Asbury came here a lot of times, and I'm sure he must have preached uh, uh, with folks who were part of this congregation at the time. But I want to come to 1903 when this church was built. Uh, it, it is an amazing building. Uh, it does look like a castle. The architecture is so interesting. Uh, one of the things I've always loved about this church is in the sanctuary, which you'll soon be back into, some of you, uh, it, it's in an Akron style, which is kind of a half circle. And I don't know how Tom feels about it, but I love to preach in the half circle because you have people right around you, and it feels like rather than being way down a long aisle, uh, it's nice to have that, that closer contact. But, but I, I think about the walls of this place. <laughs> um, I'll tell you an aside. When I came here in 1983, a Sunday school class was meeting here. It was the only church I've ever been in where a Sunday school class had people who smoked in the church building. <laughs> they did it in here. It took me a while to convince them maybe they should go outside, uh, and we say eventually did. But I, I do remember it was, a, it was a strange sensation. But anyway... Uh, uh, this, this building, if the walls could talk, I think it would, it, it, they would say so much about things that have happened here, and I think they talk about the people who've been here. Um, so many great folks, and uh, during my time here, there were wonderful people that I, I would love to start mentioning their names. It wouldn't mean a thing to you, but I'd just like to have them sounded in this building, but I'd forget somebody, and I don't want to do that, so I won't start. But I think if these walls could talk, they would remember those names. And as I thought about that, I thought about the book of Hebrews in the 11th chapter, where uh, the old Jewish writer is listing the heroes and heroines of the faith. And he gets to chapter 12 and he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He's surrounded. Years ago, I saw a, a painting. It was in uh, the Grandma Moses style, kind of rough. Uh, it showed an African-American church, and as you were looking at the painting, the preacher was down here at the pulpit and the congregation out. And then around the balcony were white-robed people. They represented the saints who had died and gone on. Now, what made this painting so fascinating to me was that they were up, up there in the balcony and they were laughing and having a great time and they were pointing down below and waving as if they could be seen and, and they were the whole thing just showed here are these saints who are encouraging the people I think about today those who've gone on before standing around the balcony of heaven saying keep on keeping on make this place even better than it's ever been don't just stop and celebrate the moments Realize that it's more to come. Those saints that have gone before us. We say uh, in part of our morning worship, I believe in the communion of the saints. They're here. They're around us. And so in my mind's eyes, I thought about this, but the question came up, what would they say to us if we could really hear them? And I don't have the definitive answer, but I want to share with you a little conjecture. I think they would say, we're so glad you remember us. We're glad that we made enough of a dent in the history of this church that, that, that we're remembered. But we're not the main thing. I think they would say to us, we are so glad you love this church building. And through, 200, through 120 years almost, you have kept this place in good shape. And it's taken a lot. <laughs> Tom and I were talking earlier this morning how much you're spending now on refurbishing this building. I remember one project we did here was like a 
quarter of a million dollars. That was a lot in that time. And that was to take care of those windows upstairs. Those are magnificent, magnificent stained glass windows. But somebody has to keep them going. And, 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 and I think the, the saints would say to us, we're glad that you do that. We're glad that you love the building, but it's not the main thing. We're glad that you love the traditions here. There are many of them, but it's not the main thing. I think they would say to us, the main thing is your personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ and your willingness to share that with those around you. That's why the church has existed for 250 years here on this corner. And that's what it will take to keep it existing in the future. The main thing is to make the main thing the main thing. It's so easy to get distracted and diverted and have the message diluted. And there are many, many ways. I want to mention two which are normally good things we think about but sometimes can be carried to the extreme. One of them is fellowship in the church. There's a wonderful Greek word, koinonia. It means fellowship, people of like mind, uh, people who come together uh, to, to have a common purpose. We need fellowship in church. We need people looking after each other. When I was here, there were some strong Sunday school classes, and they really took care of each other. And I hope there's something similar to that today. Maybe it's this group right here looking after each other. But, but that's important. Uh, there's an old hymn that says, we, we share each other's woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often from each other flows a sympathizing tear. And also add to that, there are joys that we celebrate. And that's important, but it's not the main thing. We can say mission and outreach is so important in the life of the church. It is. Please don't misunderstand me. Jesus said, when you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. That's important stuff. It's not, however, the main thing. Somebody has said, and I think it was quite a statement, that, that there's a problem in the church today. We have more keepers of the aquarium than we have fishermen. <laughs> and we need fishermen. Our main purpose is to offer Christ. There's a painting upstairs near the chapel that was purchased when I was here. Um, it shows John Wesley standing on the shore, and in this boat, which will eventually go out and catch a ship to go across to America, there's Thomas Coke and his party. And the caption of that picture as John Wesley sends them off is simply this, offer them Christ. That's what we need to do in the life of the church. I want to go back to our text for the day. Uh, it's a wonderful section here. You go read it, 1 Samuel chapter four, chapters 4 through 7. Um, I'm going to give you the Roger Elliott version. You go back and pick up the King James or the New Revised or whatever it is you're reading from. Um, but it's an important story. Israel was in battle with the Philistines, their normal enemy, so it seems. And they got whipped. And they went back and they licked their wounds and they tried to figure out what went wrong and why God hadn't helped them out. And after a while, somebody came up with an idea. They said, you know, we went into that battle on the, under our own steam and we did not carry with us the Ark of the Covenant. And so they, they sent off to Shiloh, a worship center, to bring back the Ark of the Covenant. They got it back and they were feeling good, ready to go to battle. Battle came. The Ark of the Covenant led them in. They got beat again. And along with that, the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. And this is an aside, no extra charge for this. I just, I have to tell it because I always get a smile from it. The Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they carried it around to all their territories. But everywhere they carried it, people got sick and died. After seven months, after seven months, they came to the conclusion they weren't supposed to have the Ark of the Covenant. Sometimes it takes us that long, doesn't it? Seven months. So they sent it back to Israel along with the peace offering, gold and all kinds of stuff. And Israel was so glad to get it. And as they prepared for another time when they'd have to face, and I think it was years later, that they have to face the Philistines, they said to Samuel, we think we got this. We understand it's not us. It's not the Ark of the Covenant. It's the God of the Ark of the Covenant that we need. And so when they went into battle that time, 
asking Samuel to pray for them and ask God to help them, they were victorious. And Samuel takes this big stone and he places it on the victory spot and he calls it Ebenezer, which means God has helped us. And so in that old hymn, we have the line, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. It's a marker. It says God has been with us. And there's an understanding that God will be with us. So, I want to say to you that, that we all need Ebenezer's in our life. We need places we can look back on and say, you know, I felt God's presence in my life right there. And I look back across my life and I, I see places that I went willingly and other places I drug my feet and going and decisions I made. And it's like God's hand was just kind of directing me along the way. And I look back and I say, goodness, that was an Ebenezer time. That was a, a moment when I felt close to Christ. We need those in our lives. John Wesley, the founder of our denomination, was, I think, a Christian from early age. He became a priest in the Church of England. He, he never had any real power, though, so it seems. But on May 24, 1738, he was at a meeting in Aldersgate Street in London. And, and in this building upstairs, there was a layperson reading Martin Luther's preface to the Book of Romans. Now, that's not all that inspiring. I've read it. Uh, but if the Holy Spirit gets a hold of it, it can become inspiring. Uh, and, and he suddenly came to it. I'm saved not because I'm good enough. I have a right relationship with God, not, not because of something I did, but because of something Christ did. And he said this. He said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did know Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he'd taken away my sins, even mine, and had saved me from the law of sin and death. Oh, Wesley got some fire in his body, in his mind, his heart, and he began to change all of England and a good portion of the rest of the world. A story to tell. It was a personal relationship, then it just blossomed into letting others know about it. There's a great old hymn that we'll sing in the other services, but, but it's called Blessed Assurance. Any of you know it? <laughs> Fanny Crosby wrote it. She was blind most of her life. There's a story that a friend of hers, a young friend, came to her one time named Phoebe. And Phoebe was from a wealthy family. Uh, she said to Fanny, hey, Fanny, I've written this hymn tune, and I wanted you to put some words to it. And people who knew Fanny Crosby wouldn't we're not sure that he that she could do it. She was kind of at a low point in her life, but she immediately put pen to paper and she wrote, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And then she wrote those words of the chorus. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. See how personal they got? Just like with old Wesley. You can go back to St. Paul. St. Paul had some times, he said, according to my gospel. <laughs> he, he was trying to say, this is something I know. You can't take it away from me. And now I want others to know about it too. Friends, we need Ebenezer moments so we can do the work we're called to do. The main thing is to witness, to share Christ. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and in the book of Acts, we are given in one form or another the Great Commission. Go into all the world and carry the gospel. There's nothing against the other things we do in the church. Those are important. But our primary reason for being, raison d'etre, the reason we're doing this thing is because we are called to share Christ. There is a wonderful story that I've loved through the years. I don't know when I first heard it, but it's early on in my ministry. A story about a young man who was a Christian, but he noticed that people all around him were having these highs and lows in their Christian life, and he wanted to be more consistent. He wanted, he wanted to have that relationship with Christ, and he knew it, and, and it made a difference in his life consistently. So he asked people that he knew. He said, you know, who's lived that kind of life? Who, who's had that kind of faith? And they kept naming this one man and this fellow wanted to go see him, and he found out that he had he'd moved, he lived up on a mountainside, and so he went searching for him. It was an arduous trip, and he finally got there, and, 
And, and, and as he saw the, the cabin over on the hillside, he could see eventually a man in a rocking chair and an old dog sitting by him. And he shouted out to him, may I come up? And the fellow waved him on. He went up, he introduced himself. He said, I've heard that you've lived this kind of life that I want to have. And, and even now I heard that, that you go to the village close by here and that you're involved in the church and you help people and you tell the story. I want to do that. And the man smiled and said, well, son, I've tried. He said, but let me, let me tell you a story. He said, years ago when my old dog and I were a lot younger, we were sitting out here on this porch and we have seen animals go across in front of us. we have seen a cougar, a panther go by. we we we'd seen a, a mama bear with her cubs. we have seen deer and turkey and, and the wolves. So we, we, so we've seen, but one day something unusual happened. We saw running across in front of us a big old white rabbit. And we don't see those here. He said that, that white rabbit caught my old dog's attention and he went chasing that thing, chased it up the hillside and down the hillside and I could hear him barking and baying. And he said, you know, after a while he was out of sight, but then I heard other dogs join his pack and they were chasing that rabbit everywhere. It went on a long time and then I could hear dogs falling away until there was only my old dog left chasing that rabbit. He said, son, you know why? My old dog was the only one chasing the rabbit. I said, no, that's right, don't. He said, son, he was the only one who'd actually seen the rabbit. <laughs> That's why we need Ebenezer moments. So we have the power to keep chasing. Not because we're trying to earn our salvation, but because we want to say to, to Christ, Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. I want to do this to honor you. And so we, we think about the history of this church, and, and we ought to celebrate it. We ought to honor it. But we ought to remember what brought us here. What, what spans across 250 years and what will happen 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now. Friends, it will happen because we were willing to share the story. Now, we Methodists aren't too good at that. Just to be frank with you, we aren't. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact we, we don't want to appear self-righteous. We don't want to coerce anyone into faith. We don't want to grab them by the lapel and say, brother, sister, are you saved? By the way, I found that to work, but that's not usually the best style. <laughs> there was a preacher back in the mid-50s that I heard about, and he said something that I've remembered all across these years. He said, his name was D.T. Niles. He said, evangelism ought to be like one beggar showing another beggar where the bread is. In our case, one sinner showing another sinner where the bread of life is. That's our job. The first thing is to have that close, personal relationship with Christ. If we take that to heart, and if we're willing to tell the story, this church will not only exist for 250 years, it'll be 300, 400, 500. Why? Because we made the main thing the main thing. have this responsibility and it's not always easy but we can certainly say in boldness I want to tell you about something that's made a difference in my life if you're interested we can talk even more about it Lord give us courage and please give us those Ebenezer moments because there's much to do we make our prayer in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Roger. Uh, at our uh, doorways, we do have giving stations as well as a link on our bulletin or on our website if you would like to contribute to the life of Centenary United Methodist Church. Now let us offer ourselves to God and our gifts for the ministry of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, my word for me is a 
celebrations to share this morning? Uh, just wanted to kind of update you guys. Uh, thanks to the contribution of so many people in this congregation, I was able to make it past round one and into round two of the, uh, the, the showcase. So um, that'll be starting, the next round will be starting this coming Saturday. Thank you guys so much for your support so far. <laughs> I'll actually be shooting that music video this afternoon. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm gonna dump a piano in the middle of here. Pray for me. Um, <laughs> and uh, all four of us, I think, will be playing a new song church this coming Friday um, with a bunch of other wor worship leaders from around the community. And uh, would love to have you there. Uh, the event's on Facebook at New Song Church. Just uh, type that in and you'll find it. That's the thing I can't remember. <laughs> I believe it's seven to nine. Seven to nine. Are there others to share this morning? Joyce, are there concerns? Pastor Michael, I lost a uh, good friend and a mentor suddenly uh, this week. We're gonna lay him to rest today. Uh, so just prayers for his family and for uh, for those that'll, that'll be at that service today. What's his name? Dave Martin. We lift up Dave's family in these prayers. Are there others? My uncle. Uh, Cody's uncle, he passed away this past week and they will celebrate his life on Wednesday. Extend a belated happy birthday to you, Melissa. Yes. Yes. Are there others? Unspoken. Let's pray. like this in times of worship. We're grateful for our joys and we're grateful for that presence in the midst of our troubled times. God of hope, we see the evil that happens in our world. From another mass shooting in Buffalo to the baffling actions happening in Ukraine. We know there's pain and anger closer to home as well. And we pray that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses to help your children have the strength to carry out your vision of love, grace, and peace. So teach us how to better love and accept diversity in our land. Help us to treasure one another for the wondrous gifts and talents that each person has. Sharpen our ears to hear words of love when whispered and shouted. And finally, tune our hearts to hear your message and share your message of loving acceptance and compassion for all. May we fill our hearts strangely warm as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
stand and continue our time of worship.